Welcome to Season 2 of The String Podcast, a Southgate Media Group production, where we talk all about Guillermo del Toro's horror fantasy series, The String. We are currently covering the series' second season on FX. I'm your host, Blair Knight Graves, Director of Social Media and Associate Editor from TVBinges.com, and with me today is Kyle Tremley, the Editor-in-Chief at TVBinges.com. You can find us on Twitter at, at @blairlovestv and at KyleLovesTV. Remember, both Kyle and Blair have an E at the end. You can also follow this podcast Twitter handle at, at the strain Pod. Hi, Kyle. How are you doing today? Blair, I am chopping up my wig and throwing it in the garbage. How are you? <laughs> um, I am praising the sheer gods for allowing that wig to come off. <laughs> the, the, the gods of baldness and of hair growth have conspired yes. together and said, this must be righted. <laughs> thus, they have spoken, and it has been. Yes. Wow. If only it had been cut up with a bone sword, that would be the only thing that would make it better. <laughs> like, <laughs> like a fantasy movie, where, <laughs> where the wig was the villain. I mean, the wig has been the villain. I was going to say, that, that actually describes the strain, a fantasy movie in which the wig was the villain. <laughs> <laughs> That's the perfect description. <laughs> Pretty much. Oh. <laughs> and now the villain has been slain. <laughs> um, today, you and I will be discussing Season 2, Episode 5, Quick and Painless, which was written by Liz Fang, who is known for her writing and producing work on 90210 and Hung, which was an HBO show that <laughs> uh, lasted for a season and a half, I believe. An, which H- is- an HBO show with a really interesting premise. Google it. <laughs> um, um, although, don't Google Hung. Google Hung HBO, or else you can get yourself in real trouble there. Right, um, right. We- I, I assume Quick and Painless is referring exclusively to the wig cutting scene. <laughs> yes. Uh, man. Because, you know, it, it isn't painful to cut a wig. <laughs> Little known fact. Yep. You could trim your wig all you want. It doesn't matter. It was quite an interesting wig cutting scene because it's so clearly, it's so clearly not a person shaving their head. Like, because that would just, like probably hurt him because there's almost certainly glue so he just like took scissors and just like snip snip it was very it was very funny it's nothing like natalie portman in v for vendetta no (laughs) i I would say on on the scale of wig cutting scenes um, or hair cutting scenes it is uh it is it was not all that dramatic in terms of what happened on screen but in terms of what it signified very dramatic and in terms of what happened on Twitter, very dramatic. Oh my gosh. Twitter Twitter has never been so alive for this strain as it was <laughs> in the, the moment that F finally, finally shed the wig that's been holding him back. Like one of those parachutes that drags behind you when you're running sprints. The, the wig has just been, been keeping him back. And so as soon as he shaves it, suddenly now he's starring in his own Bourne movie. He's like, <laughs> he's like executing train espionage. <laughs> like... F has been this lame ass doctor this whole show, or scientist, who, who's like not even a good scientist, and he's a drunk, and he's not doing anything. He shaves the wig. Very next scene, he's fooling security guards. He's throwing people off the train. He's eluding Homeland Security. Like, what, the, the, I mean, it was instant. The the the, uh, the feedback was instant from getting rid of the wig. Although you know what was uh, very interesting that just occurred to me regarding that wig. Yeah. He got his fake ID before he shaved his head off. True. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, that's terrible. Not great. <laughs> it's I'm not good. Say I... that. Not a good thing. <laughs> not a good thing. Considering um, it fooled literally 500 people in this episode. <laughs> well, wow. despite... <laughs> All these wiggy do we shenanigans. Need to take a breather after that. I know. I know. Do we just need to walk away for a second? <laughs> That's an and early like... revelation that just shook my world. <laughs> yes, despite that terrible continuity error. Yeah. Uh, what in general did you think of Quick and Painless? I thought it was a whole lot of fun. I did too. Yeah, I think you can uh, you can tell by the, the tone of our conversation. Sometimes this podcast starts like a funeral, <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe a little a little bit often. But um, last episode was great. And this episode, well, maybe not in terms of, like, the logic of the episode, as you have already expertly pointed out. Um, I don't think this episode made a lot of sense, (laughs) but in terms of just being awesome and having fun things happen, that's kind of why Mm -hmm. I felt like a Bourne movie. Like, this felt like an action movie. Right. Which, which, 
if anyone's listened to our podcast in the past, that's kind of where my tastes lie with the strain. I think I think I've given up the ghost on this being like one of the great like Mad Men style shows of TV, the first like great serious horror television show. Um, I just want it to be awesome, and this episode was awesome. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I yeah. sometimes sometimes I don't need you know a brilliantly crafted plot. I just need guys getting thrown off the train, and I'm happy. <laughs> and, you know, I'm a simple man. Uh, I I would say I I am not so much the action person. I I do enjoy it, and I love horror. And uh, for those who are listening for the first time, which you likely are not, um, uh, the difference between Kyle and I is that I've read the books and he has not, so we have very different information about this. I would say that this episode, as a book reader, was incredibly surprising because they took dramatically different a dramatically different turn uh for the for the entire story that is i can't wait to see how they've restructured it honestly like this is the first some one of the first times where i was like all right cool i'm i'm down with this this is a good change um and in general this but that being said, not being a huge action person, one thing that you and I talk about all the time on the podcast is we want panic. We want people to be freaking out that there are all these monsters. And yes. it feels like finally the panic has arrived and it was executed really, really well. Yes, there were things that didn't make sense and there's a lot of strange continuity errors, but the panic was just like overwhelming in a really good way. Like I, I was on the edge of my seat the entire episode and I would say there are very few episodes of The Strain that make me feel that way. It, it really started with that first scene um, which I thought like, I thought we just, because you know last week we started with this incredible weird, odd jarring cold open about uh, the Luchador movie, the corny vampire movie from the 50s. The Silver Angel. Yeah, this episode we started with the raid redemption. <laughs> like, <laughs> we, just, we just went right into a police raid, and I was like, whoa, 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 stuff is happening, like, right off the bat. Like, normally the strain has to, like, warm up like a 1930s car. Like, you, you, gotta, you gotta turn the crank a few times <laughs> to, to get the show going. And this one, we just drop right in, and the police are out here behaving like they're in The Purge. And I mean, I, I'm like, this is like the strain is like instantly interesting, which is like, which never happens. It happened last week for like the first time in forever. And then it happens again this week where like the very first scene is not two people talking. It's not slow. It's like, we're, like action is happening. And yeah. the fact that it was action with characters we haven't seen before actually works for me because I, mm-hmm. I, I like when we expand the world, I like that, you know, we weren't they weren't introducing a new character. They were just showing us what's going on in the world. And then later on, they tie back in our main cast. And I really like that method of storytelling where we start with an incident that happened in the quote unquote real world, the world outside the story of the show. And then eventually, as we saw with like Nora and Feraldo and all of that, the world of our show makes its way to that incident. I really like that storytelling template as opposed to just having everything stem from our main characters. I am totally on board with that. I feel like it has been imperative and it has been unsuccessful that we get to see the way that other people are are handling what's hap- what's yes. happening to the world. Like we got Ansel in the first season. We got we got um the lawyer woman whose name I can't remember right now. We got lots of great characters with isolated stories that ended in the in the first season that were really interesting so you got kind of got to see panic firsthand from different types of characters religious people non-religious people people who are getting divorced all that stuff this is when like everybody knows what's happening and they're still failing to really like control the they're failing to control the people and they're failing to control the situation and it was just it was just awesome no other word for it like watching the cops go in have no idea what they're doing be surprisingly competent at killing them with not silver because that's definitely a huge detraction from the books you can't shoot a vampire at all in the books and expect them to be (laughs) dead um (laughs) like the show didn't know that you could shoot a vampire and kill them either like until now (laughs) because there was like a big point made about the silver Mm-hmm. In the first season, like how Abe was teaching them how to kill the vampires, and it turns out you can just kill the vampires however you want, really. <laughs> shoot them in the stomach. Who cares? <laughs> I th- 
I think the uh, I think that the show decided that they needed it to be a little more practical and a little less mystical. Yeah. Um, because like all the silver and all that is explained in the third book as to why all they are sensitive to all these different things, and it's a great explanation, but it's a very mystical explanation. And if you want the show to seem more of a science based show, um, like where you actually are sympathetic to your scientific characters in the books, like the characters eventually kind of give up the idea of science. But I think the show is smartly taking a different direction of saying that that there's a lot more science to this than we previously knew. That makes sense. And it also, I think, is is just a, a reflection of, of the difficulties of, of making a TV show versus writing a book. Because one of the things with the book, and I can only speak to the first one, but the other two were written by the same authors, is that um, the, the book avoids the issues of, um, like other characters having to kill people because all the stories are told point of view style from character from varying characters in the story. And so it never needs to have a scene where police are like raiding a, you know, a, 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 an area like, like police who haven't even been introduced as characters and who don't really matter as characters raiding a vampire lair or something like that. Doesn't, that kind of scene doesn't matter in the books because the books are following main characters. But it, when you're making a show, Everything matters because th- you see the settings. You know, you can't – in the right. book – if the book – if you don't care about a setting, you don't describe what that setting is. In the TV show, if the show takes place in New York, you're seeing New York. The book can avoid describing what New York looks like. The TV show has to describe what New York looks like because it's a visual medium. And so I think it maybe it's just born out of practicality that it's really tough to make an awesome action show when only about four people actually know how to kill the vampires. <laughs> like that's, right, right. that's a tough sell. Like you can't – how do you – you, you can only have so many sword scenes – you know, before you got to change it up with the vampires. And so by opening up the world to allow, you know, any anyone with a gun essentially to kill the vampires, it gives the show a lot more flexibility in terms of um, h- how it wants to do its action sequences. And I thought that was actually – it's a cheat, obviously, but I think it, it, I, I'm all for cheating if it makes everything simpler and allows the show more latitude to tell the story that it wants to tell. And it feels more like, it tells the story it wants to tell and gives it more latitude, but it feels more realistic. Like, as oh, you're saying, you... This, well, is a, this is a show where we have accepted the premise of vampires. <laughs> right, exactly. Once you accept the premise <laughs> right. of vampires, you should also, though, need to accept the premise that there are people who will learn how to kill those vampires without the knowledge of silver or anything like that. But in this case, the learning was just shooting them with a gun. Yes. There was, no, there was no. It's not even like Walking Dead, where you got to chop off their heads. Like this, just seemed like they were just shooting them. <laughs> well, I would say they were head boom headshotting them. <laughs> boom boom. Boom boom. <laughs> not, not set this episode, by the way. I felt like felt really reined it in from the last episode. I he mean, really gra- did. granted, he, he twice stuck his head into a wall, like within six inches of a vampire, but still. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Based on what he, how he was behaving last episode, that still qualifies as being reined in. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, all right, we should get to the actual content of what happened with all of our characters. Sure. Um, I'm not entirely sure where to start. I think it's probably with F and Zach. I feel like that's sort oh. of sort of where. Do we really have to bring it down so fast? <laughs> We're having a good time, and I can just see Zach sitting over in the corner with that scowl on his face. Refusing to hug his dad until the last possible moment. Well, he hugged his dad because he he saw that his dad was bald. And he was like, thank (laughs) God you got rid of that wig. I guess I'll (laughs) hug you. Just because you made one good decision in your miserable life. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Um, But but with F and Zach and and Nora, I would say like that trio, I was – this episode, for me, we've always talked – we've talked frequently – at least in the recent past, about how Nora doesn't seem to have characteristics. Yeah. I feel like in this episode she did. I don't know, or adjectives are, is the way, yeah. Are you, are you qualifying um, feel, babysitter as an adjective? <laughs> she kind of refused. She was a babysitter and then not a babysitter at the same time. She's also, right. she also was in control. She was confident. She uh, had a belief she believed in her son believed in everybody around her but in not the way that they wanted to be believed in. you know like mm-hmm. there I would I thought that there was a lot more character work done with Nora in this episode than there has been probably in the last nine that have featured her I, I don't know if I agree with that um I think she was used primarily as a plot device in this episode she was used 
as an excuse to get F alone to Washington, D.C., because he would never leave Zach by himself, as the show itself knows. So Nora volunteering to stay back is a sort of means to uh, allow F to still maintain that he's not abandoning his son, but get him alone on his born identity adventure. Um, <laughs> and then she was used to get fed out of prison because she's peddling this knowledge about how to detect the, uh, the virus to Feraldo who calls off her police force to, to let Fett go. And I, I feel like she was being used very much as plot spackle in this episode. Mm. She was just being sort of thrown around from plot to plot. And we just sort of connected the, du- she was sort of the connective tissue for a variety of stories, basically to facilitate F's story and to facilitate, um, Fett's, Fett and Dutch's story. Um, I don't know what Nora's story was necessarily. She, I mean, grand, she she had a a fairly nice moment where uh, she's talking with Feraldo about um, the, the, Feraldo's uh, nephew, who's mm-hmm. you know who tested positive for the virus and needs to be killed. That was that was a nice moment. I I don't know what. I mean, maybe you have a better read on what that what exactly that told us about her. I thought it was a fine scene. I just don't know what we learned about her. But but overall, I felt like her purpose in this episode was just to sort of get other characters where they needed to go. You know, I am I am going to reevaluate okay. based on everything you just said. I think her performance was better in this yes. episode than it has been. She, she did a good job. Yes, and and was gave an interesting performance. I just think her functional role was the same as it's always been, which is facilitating other characters' functional roles. Yes, okay. that's that's fair. But yeah, I think Mia Maestro did a a, a good job with the material. Me too. <laughs> she, she's yeah. The the complaint has never been with her. I think, um, you know, I mean, it, it, there's times when she's been, I would say, anonymous in her performance, yeah. um, but I don't think she's ever been like outright bad. And this episode, again, I really liked that scene with Feraldo, um, with her nephew and, and Nora sort of very compassionately, but firmly explaining that there's no coming back from this. Right. But I think that was reminding us that she is a scientist and she knows what she's doing. She's not just a sidekick. And I think she said very clearly to F, I'm not your sidekick. Um, yeah. Then she volunteers to babysit his kid. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All right. All right. Fair. Fair, fair, fair. <laughs> okay, but so then you were talking about, you know, she's used to kind of navigate us through all these points to yeah. allow F to go to Washington, D.C. on uh, the scariest train ride ever. Um, <laughs> or the most drunken uh, train ride ever. I'm train drunk. Sure. Train drunk, <laughs> hey. Getting train drunk during the day. <laughs> Hashtag drunk F. Yeah, I, I mean, if, if there's one thing you, you should do when you need to... <laughs> when you are a wanted fugitive who is attempting to fool Homeland Security in a very confined space that you cannot exit, um, it's definitely drink a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that's, plan, that's plan A right there. I, how did you feel about all of this F material? I loved it. Yeah? I loved it. I, yeah. I again, I am an action movie person. I am now just rooting for Strain to become a fun, campy action movie. L- like everything in life, I'm rooting for it, for it to become Pacific Rim, which I know hurts you, but I, that's what I uh, like. Like if season four is just is just big robots fighting big vampire monsters, is it'll be my favorite show in the world. <laughs> so uh, I know I'm physically hurting you right now. You're physically hurting. Me. <laughs> The, the, other than myself having read the books and you having not, yeah. the other biggest interest, the biggest difference between you and I is that I think Pan's Labyrinth, a Guillermo del Toro film, is like the best film ever. It's my favorite movie. And you love Pacific Rim. And yep. I, and that those are two very different representations <laughs> of Guillermo del Toro. I really, I really feel like that alone sums up the differences between us. <laughs> that, <laughs> I feel like we can just tell like someone who's never listened to one of our podcasts that and they would kind of get what our dynamic is um <laughs> but having said that again i also as as has become apparent already i love the born movies i love heist <laughs> oceans 11 is my favorite movie like so i like smart thrillers like that not even like smart like overtly smart like not um that 
dumb. Uh, oh, I'm trying to think about um, the Turing machine with Benedict Cumberbatch. What's the movie I want to reference from a couple? Of years I know ago? what movie. I know it's not <laughs> the Imitation years. Game. The Imitation Game. Yeah, that, like like that's not to me. Like I don't like that movie. That's a dumb movie. But it's, it's like <laughs> ale- I'm just firing shots. But <laughs> you just hate the it's world. A, it's allegedly a smart movie. I like smart movies that just like are smart because they know when to move. They like they know they know how to get going and, and and start flying and just are, are moving so fast that the plot points don't really register as being dumb and that to me is what this f train rider up was like if you really broke it down i'm sure nothing about it made sense i'm sure it's absolutely ludicrous that f would get on a government train that all of his former bosses happened to be on <laughs> And would pass every security checkpoint with this fake ID that he seems to have gotten from a bar. <laughs> that the FBI wouldn't have any kind of ID scanning technology, <laughs> which which seems pretty standard in any government situation. But what I'm saying is, all that didn't matter because he freaking threw barns from a train. I know. <laughs> Nothing matters when that happens. Like, F I got know. Into a, bald F, by the way, looking 5,000% more awesome, gets into a train fight, throws Barnes off a train. All is forgiven. Boom. And acting 5,000 times better. I don't know. Oh. I, it's so strange. I don't in any way, shape, or form want to say, like, his performance was worse when he had the wig on. But his performance was worse when he had the wig on. It, it, it's not even an opinion. It's a fact. Like, what is it that it was it that going through makeup for so long irritated him? I don't like. I don't know why. Why it would be that much better? You know, I don't. I just think confidence is important in life, and when you know you look ridiculous, it doesn't matter what you're doing. You know, it doesn't doesn't matter if you're an actor or you're a a, a paper pusher or or you're a podcaster. If you if you just feel bad about your appearance, you're not going to do your job as well. And and and. Corey still had some fun quotes this week about um, how he recognized, like, apparently the audience just can't get past it, so we got to cut the wig. Wait, um, he said that? N- no, uh, I- I'm par- I'm paraphrasing. He's, he's, oh, okay. It's not exactly that. And and they've been very clear to stress that the wig was always going to come off. Like that was the plan from the start. This wasn't like improvised due to audience response. But still, right. I like to I like to imagine that it was. In any case, just. I feel like he, he, he just got set free. Like he was in he, – he, he was a, a caterpillar in the larva before this and then the wig came off and suddenly he's a beautiful butterfly. <laughs> I just, I, he was just spreading his wings. He, he suddenly felt like an action hero, which is something that you and I talk about all the time, how Fed is the action hero of the show and F just seems like a nothing. Uh-huh. It's like suddenly – again, F is starring in an action movie and he's awesome and, and it's Corey Stoll and he, and he looks great and he just – he just is such a I, – I, I can't even – like I have no technical knowledge of this. He's just a better character bald. It's just yeah. a fact. He's just yeah. better. I don't know what to tell you. He's just better. <laughs> and this, this episode was proof. Yeah. No, I 100% agree. I felt like I was able to kind of settle in. It's strange how distracting it was, right? Yeah. Because, because – you know, you and I spend a lot of time on Twitter. Um, we will talk about wig talk later, which we'll is something that we, which we do on on Twitter. Which the is final the, wig talk. The final wig talk. Um, but it, it's it's amazing how much of our energy has been put into criticizing that wig and into <laughs> acknowledging its existence. And like, there were points where I even felt bad. I was like, we're making a lot of content about this, and even right now we're doing it as well. Yeah. Um, but. But it, it's amazing that after it came off, and I, you and I have said this before, Corey Stoll's a very attractive man. Why would you put a rat on his head? Um, so when, when you take that hair off and he's just like himself, as you said, he's got this confidence, he's got this swagger, he seems to be settled in more into his character. The episode just took an incredible turn. It was, it, it's so strange. I, I feel very odd talking about it in that way, but that's like what it was. It took an incredible, wonderful turn. Yeah. It, 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 that's a real thing. Like, like it, it's so funny because because we will get to wig talk later, but we're, we're doing wig talk now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because that was really the, the thing of this episode, and yeah, we're joking about it and we're we're making fun and all that. But there is something to it. Like like the the reason that the conversation about his wig never dissipated is that there was something about it that that really truly messed with the character. That. Mm-hmm. It, 
it, it, and it's not that it's not like it was like a, an atrociously bad wig. Like it, it just it didn't work. It didn't yeah. work with the character. Didn't work with who he is. It it didn't. I think there's there is some truth to what uh, Guillermo del Toro said in, in the press that um, the fact that he became famous as P- Peter Russo on House of Cards right before the first season premiere definitely contributed to it because suddenly yeah. we we all knew what Corey Stoll should look like. Right. And so I think that that definitely was a contributing factor. But it it was there was something about it like something real and and, and that kind of little stuff. You know, I, we talk about the little stuff a lot on this podcast about how the strain a lot of times ignores the little stuff and it hurts the show with its world building with its character work. That's just another one of those things where it just it just hurt the show in some unquantifiable way. And it it hurt the performance in some unquantifiable way. And you get rid of it and and it's it's just everything works better and you don't know why and it doesn't make sense and it doesn't need to make sense because that's how the world works everything is a million variables the the you know if, if we could pinpoint to a science why a tv show works or why a character works why an episode works then every episode every character every show would always work if it was right. a science we would master it but it's not a science it's it's a million variables and we don't know 990,000 of them and mm-hmm. one of those in that vast universe of variables that are unknown to us just happened to be in this case the wig and yeah. and the wig came off and it fixed that variable and suddenly the whole show works just a little bit better and and sometimes you just say hey we don't know why but it now works and let's just keep going <laughs> yeah no and it's interesting the way that you would frame that because i just think about other historical sci-fi fantasy shows that have had things that work and don't work and they've had to adjust like um m- the or just like something that you don't know is going to be the thing that makes your show better, like right. like the addition of Spike on Buffy. Yes, they added him as a bat a villain for season two, and he had such an incredible response from from everybody from all the viewers that they signed him on for seven more seasons. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like right. one of those things where you don't know what that variable is. Is it a part of the costuming? Is it the character design? Is it the performance? Because Corey Stoll's performance was still fine before, sure. but it, as, it's significantly better now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, this happened with, uh, with Mad Men. Um, I, I forget. I think it was Pete Campbell. The Pete Campbell character was supposed to be a one season character. I think who's, that who's from Buffy and Angel. Go ahead. Sure. <laughs> I, I, I think that's it. I might be wrong about that. There is a story of this nature with Mad Men. It happened with The Wire, too. One of the characters on The Wire, I forget which, but you, you hear the story all the time, is the point. This idea that a character was supposed to be like an afterthought and then suddenly becomes central to the, to the reason the show works. And it, it, it's something that, ha- and and here we're talking about a character being removed, and that character was the wig. But <laughs> but it's you know weird stuff happens, and we like things for weird reasons, and we don't like things for for weird reasons, and it just it just made it work. Whatever it the the removal of the wig just made everything work. <laughs> I agree. Um, but that wasn't everything that was great about this. Episode. No, we, like, we should not limit it to that. No, we should not. Now that we've just spent the last seven minutes talking about yes. the wig. Yes. <laughs> I'm sure the wig talk army is very happy right now. Shout out to the wig talk army. <laughs> um, but a, a, a lot of other very um, interesting things happened with our characters. Yeah. Um, I do want to talk a little bit, though, before we pivot to another character, um, about F having killed Barnes. Um because that's a really um, that's a really extreme thing to make that character do. Um, that yeah. is very different from the books. Um, Barnes plays a really, really important role in the third book. Um, so for him to now be gone is is a sign to all of us who have read the books that. Things are a change in a lot. <laughs> well, um, you know what I say, Blair? Hmm. No hair, no rules. <laughs> and and Corey Stoll now is is unbound. Or I should say F now is unbound by the former rules that he was following. Whatever code the man had is now gone down the drain, like like the like the shards of wig. It's just. I'm sorry. I'm still talking about the wig. It's going to be a running theme throughout the rest of the episode. But yeah, it's an extreme thing. And of course, I don't. I. I hadn't thought about Barnes since like early season one, so I obviously right. don't didn't. It wasn't that surprising to me. He seemed like a jerk. He seemed like uh, he, he was going to ru- he was going to blow this right. He was going to go in and talk to him, talk right. to the. He was going to tell on us essentially. He was going to tattle on him. Right. So we had uh, so, something had to be done. And look, when when you're Jason Bourne, you don't mess around. 
<laughs> and Ev didn't. Can I just say also, uh, for everybody who watched it live, there were a lot of Hitman commercials. <laughs> great. Watch? Yes, great point. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was a, a, a Transporter commercial, but it's not uh, Jason Statham anymore. It's a new guy. But for a second, I thought we were going to be f- three for three. <laughs> just, just an hour of bald assassins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in suits. <laughs> yes. Fantastic. That, 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 that has to be some kind of synergy. Like the marketing people knew what they were doing. Exactly, exactly. Um, okay, so we touched a little bit on Nora and just Justine. I called her Janine on accident on Twitter today. Is it Justine Feraldo? I, I think it is. I, I think it's Justine Feraldo. I just call her Feraldo. <laughs> um, last week, you and I posited that Feraldo was going to be a bad guy. Yes. Does this... Does the events of this week's episode change your mind at all? Yes. <laughs> okay. I, 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 now, granted, this show does some weird things with its bad guys, as we'll get to Palmer later. But it's hard for me to, <laughs> it's hard for me to imagine a scene as sympathetic as the nephew scene if she really is working for the vampires. Yeah, I think I'm... I'm, piv- I'm slightly changing that thought. I still think inevitably she's going to be a bad exactly, guy. Exactly, that's. But it. she's a different kind of bad guy. The, no, I think the. Um, I think she will eventually be working for the vampires. I think they'll either recruit her or turn her. Um, but I don't think she is currently. I think she is currently more or less at face value. What what she is, which is someone who is leading a very ruthless army of uh, police army through housing developments to try to stop the vampire virus like that's who i believe she is at this point which really upset me and but is upset me as as a moral and just human being that i think i am um (laughs) probably i'm not wow (laughs) humble brag Um, humble brag hey um because the idea that the police are coming through to protect people but then rounding them up and taking them to a quarantine zone is like to check to make sure like that's just it's very 1984 it's very like it's very like i'm i mean i can't even think i'm trying to think of another country in the world that has this problem no, but <laughs> like, I, I think this is a much more interesting comment on the government and how it would respond to this kind of crisis than what season one was making. Which season one posited that the government would just do nothing. That there were, that it was incompetent. Yeah, that it, was, that it was incompetent and ignorant and careless of all of this. And that might be true. I'm not saying that's inaccurate, but I'm, I'm also saying that the the fact that social media exists is a big deal and was not addressed well enough in season one because there would have been so much pressure on the government due to the thousands of YouTube videos of vampire maulings. And like there were, you can just imagine what kind of movement there would have been like real movement uh, to, to get this information public. Like just the way that society works in 2015 or 13 or whenever the show is taking place, it would, I just can't imagine that the government would have been allowed to do that when vampires are murdering people in the streets. But having said that, I think it's a much more interesting response that the government is, or, or well, this one uh, facet of the government, for all though, is reacting so far the other way that people are getting rounded up and checked and all of that. Because I think I think that's a much more interesting response. Not only does it create more drama. And it obviously led to you know a variety of good scenes in this episode, but it um, it asks more interesting questions about the government and politics and all of that. Yeah, and it opened up some pretty th- those questions opened up some pretty terrifying moral conundrums. Like obviously, there's the the military state part that we've already discussed, but then the right to choose when when and how you die when you are infected, right? The right to choose not to be an experiment for scientists mm-hmm. at the CDC. That was very subtly dropped in there. And that's one of the things that I think will probably become very scary later on with Feraldo. Is that they're, they're, out of the four people that Nora examined, one of them had worms. And, he, and she said, well, it's up to him and his family how he should die. And right. we all should know that that is not going to be the case. Yes. And that Justine Feraldo, especially now that she's had to kill her nephew, who she was very close with, after that moment, that's going to be a turning point for her where she is going to become ruthless. And, and I think that that makes her a wonderfully sympathetic in a very different way human character. Because 
what is it, it? It forces, and this is this is what's good about apo- apocalypse shows, right? Like when you ha- are forced to ask these questions about the government or your own morals or things like that. Like it did not work with F and Nora, who are our heroes, having to make that call and infect a person with a disease after they were saying, "Please let me go." Um, but it, I think it will work with Feraldo because she's in a very different position and she has a very different amount of power and different kind of power. And this is this is the stuff that when The Walking Dead has done, you know, you know, it's not that the zombies you should be scared of; it's the people. Yes. Whenever they really do that well, that's when The Walking Dead is really, really interesting. And you know, Battlestar Galactica did that a lot. Um, when the the robots killing all the humans stuff like that, like it, the, it's a nice different type of moral conundrum to come to to watch what makes a person into a monster and what constitute a monster in an extreme uh, situation. I, I really like that. I, I I agree with that one hundred percent. And I think the Walking Dead comparison is really good. That's something that the strain has largely avoided the idea that the humans are actually the real threat here. Right. Um, not in the big, big picture sense, obviously. The master is probably the biggest threat, I would say. But, <laughs> but in, 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 the, uh, in the small picture, in New York City right now, that we could end up with a situation where Feraldo is doing more harm than good and like slaughtering people in mass as mm-hmm. a way to try to, to save them. And it's like that's, that's a very interesting uh, just political conundrum and, and, and uh, thought process and just th- that's just much more fertile storytelling ground than the government is burying its head in the sand and doing nothing yeah that's it's just there's so much more dramatic uh action and and dramatically satisfying conclusions the show can draw on that route yeah no absolutely um and i agree the government having their heads in the sand was one of the more laughable things about right. last season it, it made it a very difficult show to watch and take seriously um at least with the government doing something, like, despite all the continuity errors and despite there being a lot of issues that we could go through in this episode if we wanted to, it became a sit-at-the-edge-of-your-seat show because it was interesting and because it made you think and it made you worry. Um, And and so it it did something successful. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, absolutely. Uh, (laughs) The strain doesn't always succeed in those types of things. Like, again, I brought up Nora and F doing experiments before. I don't... There was a payoff for that, but I don't think that it was... By any means, uh, I I don't, I don't want to say like acceptable to sit through. It's just that that's not what you want from your main characters. Yeah, it's not what you want from your protagonists. No, and that was more not about what happened, but how it happened. It was just something uncomfortable about that scene and and how F was behaving. Like like I didn't feel and. For whatever reason, I didn't feel any negativity towards F for launching Barnes off that train. Like, none whatsoever. <laughs> like, totally fine in my book, F. Do what you gotta do. And it may be, again, I'm giving him credit because he now has no more hair. But <laughs> but it just, there's just, uh, something was deeply uncomfortable about watching him uh, tie down that old couple as they died. That was not uncomfortable about watching him throw Barnes off a train. Like, it just, it just sometimes, you know, I mean, it, it, it's... It shouldn't be that way technically because the old couple was going to die anyway. They had about an hour to live no matter what. And and Barnes was, for all of his faults, a government employee who, as far as we know, hadn't killed anyone as far, <laughs> that I can remember. You know, it's like, not, like, not like he's someone who you could just pronounce the death penalty on. But for whatever reason, like the circumstances, the characters, the way it was presented, it just – sometimes things feel acceptable and sometimes they don't. And uh, – it, that that scene where earlier this season kind of didn't, and I think F's behavior in this episode did. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I think that it's easier to watch that kind of behavior as was earlier in the scene with somebody like Justine than it is to watch it with F and Nora. Yes, right. That being that being said, though, um, they are they are pushing F's alcoholism a lot faster in this story yeah. than they did in the books. In the books, it's a little bit of a slow burn uh, that becomes really difficult by the end. But it's been no. like, like it's last last week with him, you know, guzzling two sh- glasses of scotch within five minutes <laughs> yep. of each other, and this time going to the bar and buying three beers. <laughs> like, yeah. It's not a usual depiction of alcoholism. F is basically on cheers at this point. I mean, he's just, he just <laughs> pounding him. Um, norm! Yeah, F is Norm. Uh, it's obviously not going to go well for him. 
I think we can yeah. make that conclusion. Uh, yeah. But yeah, you know, again, I don't have anything to compare it to. Makes sense to me. He's a he was a recovering <laughs> alcoholic, and now he's way off the wagon. So yes, it makes sense. Yes. Although it's it's a different type of way off the wagon. Um, you and I have talked about this before, and I can't believe I'm bringing up this reference. Um, but uh, in a TV show on ABC called Nashville, um, yeah. I made you watch the season finale of season one when a recovering alcoholic went on a bender. Yeah. Because I thought that that was such a great performance, and you said that it was kind of generic. That's mm-hmm. what you had said to me at the time. And um, now that I see what they're doing with F, I kind of finally two and a half years later, uh, understand why you felt that way. Sure. <laughs> uh, because this is a very unique representation of alcoholism that I don't feel like you get to see that often. I would say like the only time I've seen anything like this before was in a, a movie um, called Flight that Denzel Washington was in. I don't know if you saw that movie. Um, I, I didn't, but I, I, I saw the trailer. It's, it's worth watching. Uh, he donated his performance to that movie because he wanted to know what it was like to play an alcoholic. Oh. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> and it's very good. Um, but, you know, I think that Corey Stoll is doing a really good job with that. And I think that they're writing it in a really interesting and unique way, which it brings something wonderful to the strain whenever it does something unique. Yeah. Um, okay. So I want to talk a little bit about Fett and Dutch. Fett. <laughs> yes. Uh, D- as you said earlier, Nora was sort of forced to help D- uh, Dutch get break. Fett out of the card playing game. Um, (laughs) They negotiated a release for Fett for blowing up a subway. (laughs) I know. (laughs) Um, Which, by the way, the police officer that had arrested him in the episode previous was a lot less scary in this episode, and I liked that. You seem pretty chill, honestly. Yeah, in the last episode, it was like, whoa, this is terrible. Like, this is the police state thing that I'm terrified of. In this episode, he's like, yeah, you gotta understand that I have to arrest somebody who blows up a train. (laughs) You know what, man? You're right. (laughs) You do have to arrest someone who does that. (laughs) Right, like, that's okay. I believe you're right there. Um, (laughs) Which then leads to a really nice with Dutch Fett and the police officer where they suddenly become recruited by the cops to go and help empty a building. I, you know, storytelling-wise, don't think too hard about this one. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is not one where you really want to uh, trace the reasons and the legality and, and just why exactly within like 30 seconds they were suddenly working for the police because it led to a freaking awesome scene and that's all we really need to know. <laughs> It was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Vampire, lot. Vampires in the Walls, a, a, uh, a real cool thing for the yes. show to do. Which, actually, um, I, as said this before, I am a video producer in real life. Not When I'm not a podcaster, I'm also a video producer. And a, um, a sound designer and composer that I work with actually wanted to have to speak with us for a few minutes because he had some thoughts um, about how cool that scene was. So I'm going to bring him on. All right. Well, I have with me Devin Delaney, who is a composer at Noise Floor in Chicago. Uh, we work together a lot on video projects. And uh, we had been watching The Strain together. And he commented that this He commented to me that this episode was uh, very different from previous episodes, at least in this season. Um, So I wanted to bring you on. But if you'd like, you can give yourself a quick intro. Oh, no. I'm Devin Delaney. I'm a composer and music supervisor at a company in Chicago called Noise Floor. Um, We do a lot of work in post-audio from video games to TV shows to a lot of commercial work, too. Um, You can always find me on Twitter at Devin underscore Delaney. Um, But yeah, Blair, I could not agree with you more. Um, It actually stood out to me because it was one of the first episodes I've seen in the show that actually had kind of really cool, unique sound Mm -hmm. uh, through and through. And the balance of uh, score and uh, sound design itself was super duper entertaining, Um, especially where you guys were talking about the uh, scene with Fett. Yeah, we're talking about Fett and uh, and Dutch where um, Fett hears the feeler behind the wall and he, he goes to attack it. Yeah, that was that's what stood out. That's where I find them. I'm like, oh, they're doing something unique, and they have kind of a point of view that I really started to enjoy. Because um, I personally have always really struggled with the little kids are called feelers. Yeah, right? the feelers. Yeah, I've really struggled with their sound design. It's mm-hmm. been a little cartoonish mm-hmm. to me, um, and I'm a real big horror fan through and through. But um, it just was like so dry and so kind of over the top, um, just they, slurpy. They sound like, like weird insects. Like it doesn't feel like it 
really belongs and it's like a it's like technically at the head of the track so you you hear them more pronounced than you hear anything else and it's really like difficult to sort of navigate that content yeah when you get the cacophony cacophony of them like surrounding the mom and all that you just hear all that layer together it tends to be really cheesy but where this was so cool it was hearing it you know through on the other side of a wall as he was hitting it and you hear it more and more as he opens the wall up more um it sounded really cool in isolation as a single one um just the same as like in the intro um, or the first chunk of the thing with the police running around. Mm-hmm. Uh, I thought they had a really cool um, kind of like Resident Evil-ish vibe. Uh, mm-hmm. More the game than any of the movies. <laughs> it wasn't just constant explosions. But um, yeah, they finally had some really nice tension. And those things in isolation kind of sound cool if you put them in the right environment. It's just we're all together. It's kind of uh, just silly. Yeah, no, definitely. So in in general, what do you think of the sound effects and music and mixing on the strain? Because I know you you can't constantly comment to me how silly it is yeah i don't love it um it's it it can be a real real struggle at times and being a like i'm kind of a horror snob i like watching a lot of horror content um it just there's certain times it gets i you know i said earlier it gets a little cartoony Mm -hmm. um and that just doesn't necessarily work for me but this they seemed like this episode through and through just felt so uh like a little bit more polished and kind of had a straw like there's a strength and a confidence to it Mm -hmm. um sonically um, did you have any thoughts about how the strain uses music? Because as far as I can tell, you're mostly talking about like the sound effects, like the feelers. Um, I've never, it's never been that notable to me the way the show uses music. Do you have any thoughts this season how how the music's been used? This episode was really cool, and I got mm-hmm. that scene you guys brought up with Fett like doing the exterminator thing. It had a really fun balance of uh, like a modern score where it wasn't too you know, like over the top strings or anything like that. It was a very like kind of like a modern synthetic horror palette. And I thought the balance between the two in that scene just made it so much cooler. There was space to it, but there's also a tension and a nice texture. Um, So it stuck out to me. I have the same issue with the show where a lot of times it doesn't kind of stick out or it's just kind of there. Um, This really seemed to serve it and it, it it helped the scene a lot. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, Well, being super understated. Yeah. Yeah. But like this episode, or that specific scene, but this episode in in large parts of the whole episode, but that scene is going to be one of the most memorable scenes of the strain, I think, ever. And I think that that's because it was just technically so well done. It yeah. w- it wasn't just that Fett is hilarious, like poking holes through walls and like that the really cool vampire stinger coming out and Dutch cutting it and all that. It was like you kind of were immersed in that scene. You kind of like felt like you were in it. And I think that that's something that the strain kind of fails at a lot is when the sound is just like too overbearing where the, the feelers sound like <laughs> they sound like insects, which is really strange. Why would children sound like insects? <laughs> and and the, the vampires, you know, have inconsistent sounds and like sometimes the dialogue is in a weird place. So it, it just was like one of those episodes where it just felt like solid. It felt solid. Like I felt, I believed in it, you know? Yeah, because they always get a lot of the gross detail, like, you know, like the heads exploding or the feelers going, like, they get that detail right a lot, because mm-hmm. that's the most fun thing to do in horror. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, like, it, it was really refreshing to me that, like, this is, I hope, where the show's going sonically. Um, so, really quickly, um, besides the sound and the music and all that, um, what made this episode stand out to you content-wise? Did you really like this episode? Just, I just want to know how you felt. Oh, no, I really enjoyed it. Um, being a bald man myself, I like the head shaving, even yes. though it's like it seemed way more difficult because you're shaving a wig on an already bald dude. Like, <laughs> like I mean, that, that had to have been some good practical effects just to make it seem like he had hair. Um, <laughs> but no, I thought it was a really cool... I, I, I like where it's going. Uh, like that train scene where he tossed the dude from the train, that was really exciting and fun. Yeah. Uh, Seeing the vampire hunter dude or Quinlan, yeah, Quinlan, um, <laughs> yeah, Sorry, that was so fun. Excited. <laughs> and I really love where they're going with Fat. Yeah, like he's cool. That guy was great on Lost. He was even like passable in that bad Wolverine movie. So I'm happy to uh, <laughs> see him working and being a badass. That was Leave Schreiber. That wasn't Kevin no, he, the uh, blob. Oh gosh. Yeah, no. Most of us tried to forget all of that movie. I was super stoked for it. And- <laughs> Wolverine Origins happened, but uh, no, he's he's really great on that show, and he was yeah. awesome on Lost too. He was kind of a villain, so it's nice to see him as a uh, nice protagonist. Well, there's the Carlton Cuse connection, right? Because he was the showrunner, or he was a writer on Lost, and now he's That's the right. showrunner on sh- on the Strain. That totally makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. All right. Thanks, guys. I really had fun uh, coming on. Thanks, Devin. <laughs> 
So it seems like we can't get away from wig talk no matter uh, who we talk to. <laughs> I am so happy that his very first comment on the episode itself involved the wig. <laughs> this really is the wig talk hour. <laughs> it it, it kind of solidifies, uh, you know, our opinions of the matter. That that that's for the first thing that everybody brings up whenever we talk to. Them. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's it's inescapable. <laughs> um, okay, so the the one plot we haven't talked about yet is to track in going to meet with Cream, um, who I think you said was a guy in the wire. Marlo Stanfield, <laughs> shout out to all my wire friends, um, which is which is literally the entire internet. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so so Marlo, who who is an arms dealer, who showed up briefly in season one and really seemed like just like a a plot character, like a nothing kind right. of character, turns out to reemerge here as like Satrakian's, uh, um, I guess plot helper because he's the one who's who's gonna hook him up with, uh, with uh, I, I guess Quinlan, the, right? The the tuxedo ramen. The tuxedo ramen. <laughs> he he is the in. To, to finding the tuxedo ramen. Which, of course, is the tuxedo lumen. <laughs> yes. So the tuxedo ramen, right. <laughs> um, yeah, he did show up in season one, and I have to apologize to all of our listeners right now because um, he's a relatively important character in the books named Cream. Um, that being said, in season one, I did not recognize him. No. Nope. Um, because Cream is a Colombian heavy set man. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so Well you can um, see where the mistake came in. <laughs> yeah. So when I was on Twitter and I, I saw they show more pronounced he has silver teeth. Uh, Cream has silver over his teeth. Ah. I was I thought oh my goodness, is that cream? And I went to Twitter and I talked to everybody and sure enough, I missed that from last season. Like, he's like a really important character that I completely missed and I apologize for not having acknowledged it before. Uh, Well, to be fair, I mean, he did not seem like an important character in the first season. (laughs) He really didn't. No. but yeah, here here he is now, and I, I'm just excited. I mean, I always love it when when the Wire alums get work. And in this episode, we had a sequence where we went from a scene with Marlo to a scene of Abe driving through or, or tr- taking his train through Baltimore, which was great. Just real, it really started to feel like the Wire there for a minute. I, I was <laughs> shouting, "Where's Bubbles?" To my that's a Wire reference. <laughs> okay, sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was really, I'm really excited to see them bringing him on to actually like be a role in the show now. Um, I, again, like I had been waiting for him to be introduced, and it turns out he was introduced in episode one. <laughs> um, so I did, I did a great job. Thanks, mm-hmm. everybody. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, but yeah, though, if that or not, that uh, Abe just had such a very interesting. Situate like it, it, carrying around priceless watches and stuff like that. Like this is a, this is an aim that I really like. I like it when he like just knows how to get what he needs. <laughs> yeah, his adventure I think was the um, the least set up in this episode. I feel like even even as ridiculous as the whole Fett and Dutch setup was, at least it had a, like a through line. That through yeah. line didn't make sense, but it was there. Right. Um, in this case, Abe just sort of. <laughs> saw this he, he just knew this guy he saw him the guy happened to have a religious paraphernalia contact <laughs> it was, it was, I mean, this was real threadbare in terms of the the justification for everything that was happening but at the same time i obviously like the character and like that he's involved like that abe's getting stuff done it's it's a really um odd way to use the cream character um to the context of people like yourself uh, because in the books, he's like, you know, an underground, he runs the black market type thing. And I don't think that the set that he was on in any way, shape, or form indicated a black market to me. Like, the oh. set that he and Abe were on, like, yeah, he had a lot of stuff, but he just seemed like a petty thief. He seemed like right? a pawn shop owner. <laughs> like, yeah, or yeah, like, <laughs> right. that's, that's, a, that's a fair assessment, too. But, like, so I was... Like, I just, I thought that was just very interesting because that's not the way that I would imagine a world that a person who runs the black market right. would live in. <laughs> well, you'd expect him to be like in like the sub basement of an abandoned building. And, right. And Abe having to go through five layers of security to talk to him. Right. You know, not just walk into a garage has <laughs> no. a bunch of famous paintings in it. Yeah. <laughs> not into a garage, right? <laughs> um, but then the, the final thing that happened, um, 
at the very end of this episode, which is great because it, it felt like the episode ended and then they con- they continued forward, um, was the introduction of Quinlan, whose name they didn't say. So I apologize, everybody. But if you're on Twitter, you saw that. that was the thing. Sure, it's everywhere um, on Twitter. Yeah. And you did read the first book, and he is in the first book, but I some, something tells me you may not remember him. Uh, no. But... <laughs> I, I I feel like I know him because people have been so excited on Twitter and there was that whole thing with everyone thought the character who Vaughn. met Gus in Vaughn. season one was Quinlan, yeah. but it was actually yeah. Vaughn. And yeah. it's it's entirely possible that he was Quinlan and the show retconned that and turned him into Vaughn. Yeah. I think that, that I think that's probably likely what happened. That the they sort of rethought that character arc and decided to very ha- haphazardly kill off Vaughn so they could introduce <laughs> Quinlan. Yes. Um, but th- I think that's what that was. Um, but either way, I mean, people have been excited about this character and obviously we don't know a single thing about him yet, but um, yeah, looking forward to getting to know him. But what a cool way to enter. Sure. <laughs> Coming off a plane, dudes just said, he went that way. And <laughs> Somehow like, worked. Yeah. And he just shows up with his bone sword. It was great. It's the bone sword. It's great. I was very excited. I was like sitting here just screaming. I was like, "Yay! It's I, I, actually him!" Yes. I, the one scene I don't think we've talked about yet is Palmer's oh dance with. Oh, I, was, I, know, I know you've been trying to ignore that. I've been mildly trying to ignore that. Yeah, I feel like we should bring it up just to say, "Nope, <laughs> nope, move on the strain." Whatever you're doing with Palmer and Coco, move off of it. <laughs> Nobody likes it. Nobody likes it. It doesn't make any sense. It's uncomfortable. It's terrible to watch. Move on as fast as you can, please. Yes. It's worse than the wig. We're, mm, come on, Blair. Let's, <laughs> I, I, when, when Coco inevitably gets killed one of these weeks, um, I don't think we're going to devote an entire episode of the podcast to it. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. That's fair. You got me. Just, just <laughs> stating it like it is. Coco's going to die and we're going to be really excited because it'll mean all that discomfort will be gone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's it. It's like removing a boil. <laughs> that's exactly what it is. Uh, yes. Uh, Palmer and Coco going to dinner and then dancing while a, the city burns behind them was, mm. you know, she's like, 27 or 28 and he's like yeah. eight, 85 oh no he's like the same age as as uh as Satrakian so he's like know. in his 90s so that's just like it's uncomfortable whatever it's a it is 70 it's year difference. Yeah, 70. yeah it's uncomfortable whatever it yeah. is it's bad it's icky I don't get it yeah 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 we shouldn't do it again no. um <laughs> all right well then it's time to move on to the strain bingo strain bingo Yes, which we played again this week during the Eastern um, airing of The Strain. Thank you to everyone for participating. It's a lot of fun uh, checking off the bingo squares as we go along. Um, I want to shout out uh, a, a, either a new fan or, or, or a fan, an old fan who just connected with us for the first time. But um, Catherine on Twitter, her name is Super Nyan Cat. I think Nyan is how you say it. I've only, <laughs> I've only seen it typed. Um, cause it's that cat with a pop tart on its back, I think. Oh, Nyan. Nyan cat? Yeah. Super Nyan cat. Yeah. Uh, that's her on Twitter. Um, she took us, she, um, kept track of her stra- strain bingo card on a legal pad from Office Depot <laughs> and, uh, took a picture of it, uh, and showed it to us. And she was one space away from bingo and it was a controversial space. The one space she was missing was um, Nora's sad puppy dog face. And it was very possible that she you could qualify something as a sad puppy dog face when she told F that she was staying behind. But I'm ultimately going to rule that that was not a sad puppy dog face because it was her inflicting the sadness upon F. She was the one rejecting his offer to go with him. And I don't think... It was. It really captured the sadness of Nora when she when she is being sad. So I'm going to regrettably fair. agree with Catherine's decision to not mark that space. Mm. Um, but I still want to shout her out for for nearly getting bingo and for doing a great job tracking her her squares. Yes. Um, so for every everybody knows the the four that she did get that were surrounding it were Abe speaks ominously about the Exedo Lumen. Sure. 
Uh, Dutch and Fett flirt at a time when their lives are imminently in danger. Uh, I think she was actually going the vertical way, not the horizontal way, to, in that column. Oh, wasn't Coco yeah. suspicious of Palmer? Coco is, Palm- yeah, Coco is suspicious of Palmer, which obviously happened at dinner, when the, right. uh, when the cardinal wearing a full cardinal's outfit... <laughs> So, was that a fancy restaurant? Was that a fancy restaurant? Just happened to be there and gives a very loud spying update to Palmer. <laughs> um, so that was checked off. Palmer flirts with a woman at least four decades younger than him. Again, I was being very um, conservative with the four decade ex- estimate, but <laughs> that obviously happened and we wish it didn't. The free space in the middle. Um, the one she missed was Nora. Looks like a sad puppy that you just scolded. And the last one was a vampire stinger magically misses a main character, which really happened with Fett sticking sticking his head in a wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so four out of five, very close to our first strain bingo. Yes. Uh, but thank you so much. I'm sorry. What was her Twitter handle again? <laughs> You're going to make me say it again. Uh, Super Nyan Cat. Yes. Thank you, Super Nyan Cat. Uh, Cat with a K. Cat with a K. Yes. Thank you for playing the strain bingo. And thank you to everybody else who did. We got a couple of other submissions of people sending us their scorecards. Um, but she's the she's the only one who got that close. So yes. congratulations on getting that close. Get it next time. Or to anybody who gets it next time, you are invited to come and talk to us for five minutes on the next podcast Please. and tell us your thoughts on the episode. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think we thoroughly covered Wig Talk, but if you want to shout out to the Wig Talk army. Well, we've got one more special Wig Talk presentation. Oh, since do we now? This was presumably the last episode ever for Wig Talk. Because <laughs> um, the wig is gone. It's, it's not coming back unless, unless it is, in which case we've got a whole new set of problems. <laughs> but what I want to stress is that hashtag Wig Talk um, was never trying to start a revolution. Uh, it was trying to document a revolution, which is... The revolution of everyone on Twitter talking about Corey Stoll's wig. <laughs> um, we did not invent that concept. I feel like from the, from the pilot of the strain on, Twitter has independently be, been just basically focused on the, the wig and nothing else when it comes to the strain. Um, and so we were just trying to document and, and sort of uh, capture what, what has really been the prevailing Twitter sentiment. About, about the wig. So that's what wig talk has been, right? It's just been us trying to put a name to this phenomenon that has been happening since the strain premiered. And now it's gone. And so I have prepared a poem to commemorate this occasion. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> which I will recite now. Okay. Dear Corey Stoll's wig. In times of darkness, you were my light. In times of sadness, you were my comfort. In times of baldness, you were my hair. (laughs) You shined and you glimmered gloriously. You flowed like the strange story, laboriously. You died as you lived, ridiculously. So now that you've been thrown in the trash bag, your life has ended, though not your hashtag. Wig talk, wig talk, wig talk, I say. Wig talk, wig talk, wig talk, I proclaim. The bump of the night is not a vampire, oh no, but it's the newfound emptiness inside of our souls. Wig talk, wig talk, wig talk. Thank you very much. I apologize to everybody for laughing so hard back here. I don't know what was funny about it. It was a very sincere poem. <laughs> How long did it take you to write that? You know what? I don't want that information to be public. <laughs> I want to believe that you slaved over that for the last week, knowing that the wig was going to be gone. <laughs> oh, I, I'll tell you one thing. I wrote it way more than a week ago. <laughs> <laughs> I've been preparing for this moment. Oh, I don't think we can go anywhere else from there. I feel like <laughs> I feel like we just have to end the episode and possibly we, the podcast. Yeah, we just have to say farewell to our listeners and hope that they'll come back next week. <laughs> I'm sorry, everybody. We're Thank sorry. you. <laughs> We're not sorry. We're super excited about this. Yes. Uh, I will say that that was a shock to my system, just like all of yours, our, our, our lovely listeners. So um, <laughs> thank you, Kyle, for your... For- You're very welcome. And listeners, you're welcome too.
<laughs> All right. <clears throat> oh, got this. Okay. <sighs> Okay, um, this wraps up our 20th episode of The Strain Podcast. Before we go, I want to mention a few things. You can download and subscribe to our podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. You can also hear all of our podcasts at our website, southgatemediagroup.com. Please subscribe to the show and also rate us. Follow the show on Twitter at at the strain pod and Kyle and I at Kyle Loves TV and at Blair Loves TV. Remember, both Kyle and Blair have an E at the end. Send us your fan mail at thestrainpodcast at gmail.com and check out our website tvbinges.com to find and join our monthly binges and create your own. Thank you again for tuning in and we'll see you next week.